We look today at Romans 8 and verse 12 through 17. It's very close to a passage we just recently covered, just past that. And at the time we covered it, I had given just a little bit of discussion about the verses that we're covering today, 12 through 17. But one of the reasons that it's very appropriate for us to look at this is Sunday is Trinity Sunday. If there is a concept in Christianity that is difficult to grasp, it's the idea of the Holy Trinity, that uh, God is, as one preacher put it, three who's and one what. And uh, it seems like that every time I or someone else tries to talk much about the Trinity, we go off into heresy. Uh, one of the favorite heresies that theology geeks like to point to is, is uh, uh, St. Patrick's using uh, the uh, uh, shamrock to describe the, the, the uh, Trinity because uh, the, the Trinity, uh, he, he says that's one leaf and yet three leaves. And uh, uh, it's heresy because it reduces God down to what God does. It's heresy is known as modalism. But it's very difficult to grasp. And Paul here doesn't grasp it real well. Uh, my professor of New Testament said that Paul had a theology that was tridactic rather than Trinitarian. By tridactic, it's three similar items together, but it's not truly, it's not really Trinitarian because in, in, in a Trinitarian understanding, it would almost be better to use the word triunity, that oneness of God is not adequately expressed. Now, Paul gives a Trinitarian blessing at the close of 2 Corinthians. Uh, I, I referenced this last week. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 13, he gets the order wrong. If you remember what I said then, uh, he, gives, he gives the order in, in, in 13, 13 as Jesus Christ, God, and the Spirit. And that's not the order we're accustomed to. Uh, the New Testament doesn't use the word Trinity, and, 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 and the most developed theology of the Trinity might be found in uh, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, uh, where we're told to go all, into all the world, baptizing in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that that is the clearest expression uh, of the Trinity and, 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 and the relating of the Trinity, that you've got one baptism, one God doing the baptism, but there's three persons there, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And a side note, I seem to be spending more time on side notes today than on main path. Side note, uh, you've got people that look at the Acts of the Apostles, Acts 2 and other places, that say you're supposed to baptize in the name of Jesus. And uh, I quoted... Uh, uh, from one Sunday, Acts 19, you know, what baptism were you baptized in? Well, we were baptized into John's baptism. And I, you know, well, then he, Paul baptizes in the name of Jesus. The people that push the idea of baptizing in the name of Jesus will quote those passages to you. What they omit is, it never says in the name of Jesus only. And if you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that middle one is Jesus. And so my position and the position of this denomination is that uh, if you baptize a Trinitarian baptism, you are baptizing in the name of Jesus and the Father and the Spirit. And so instead of being shortchanged, you're getting the fullness of God. Not, not just a limited portion of God. So uh, that would be our response. But this whole idea of Trinity is difficult to understand. And, and so we're given today as an epistle reading out of, out of Romans uh, a passage that gives the Trinity 
but it gives it sort of in a strange setting because it's not cle clearly Trinitarian. It's it's not really it doesn't show the unity, but it does show the working. Now Paul here writes this some thirty years before John's Gospel. John is the last of the four Gospels to be written. It's the most developed. You got to understand that when when one book would show up. The church would read it and digest it and read it and digest it and read it and digest it. And then the next time something was written, it would be written including the input from what had already been previously written. And so it would be built on the back of the earliest gospel was Mark, but even before Mark were the letters of Paul. And so Paul would write, and in his case, he has the earliest testimony. And so people would take what Paul wrote and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and prayer and searching scripture add on and the church would recognize that those letters also were scripture. The scriptures were closed, as it were, when the church realized that the Spirit was no longer writing scripture in the sense that we had a complete testimony of Jesus and a complete understanding of what Jesus was doing uh, and calling us to do. And people would say, well, the church arbitra arbitrarily closed uh, the, the canon of Scripture. No, it, it closed itself through distance of time. And, and so we have a complete understanding of Trinity, but it doesn't occur everywhere in Scripture. It, incur it occurs at the very last of the writing of Scripture, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. So, what we've got here today focuses primarily on the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to get to Scripture, I promise you. But understand that, as one of my professors said, we modern Christians are functional Benetarians. Benetarian would mean two, where Trinitarian refers to three. By that I'm saying, we have a firm grasp on God. We even understand and receive, glorify the work of Jesus Christ. We just don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. We just don't. And, and there's a backlash because those that do nowadays talk about the Holy Spirit, talk about it in such a way that we Methodist, I was going to use the word bland, but you might take offense, so I won't say bland Methodist. We run at the idea of the excesses and extremes of those that, that really push the Spirit. And we miss out so much because we become functional Benetarians. So what the church has given us today is a passage that looks at the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Jesus is here. Yes, the Father is here. But it's really the focus of the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, as introduction to verse 12, I don't want to start with the phrase, so then, brothers and sisters, without giving you some background. I mean, so then is, is pulling from what's said before. Verse 1, chapter 8, Romans, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so this whole idea is that in Christ we have access to the Spirit of God, and Paul uses pretty much interchangeably the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ. That's not two different things. Paul just bounces back and forth between the using of that. And, and with the cross and the resurrection and all that Jesus did for us, we now have the Spirit. And that Spirit is at work in us, setting us free. And, and it, it, So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery 
to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. It is the very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may be also glorified with him. And let us pray. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. Did you notice the word adopted? We're adopted. I said a couple of weeks ago I was getting away from that word adopted. And there Paul put it right there in the middle. I would only remind you what I said earlier. There's 30 years difference between this letter and the gospel of St. John. And when John talks about birth from above, he doesn't use the word adopted. I'm not saying he, quote, corrected. It's a both and situation. These are people trying to use human language to describe something that is far, far beyond human understanding. And in one sense, we're adopted. But as John says in John 3, we're born from above. And that's a natural birth. That's not natural in the sense that it, it happens um, and, and, and that it is life to us. Um, we're born. We're not adopted in John's gospel, and that's the last gospel. It's written far after using this. And in some senses, we still are adopted here on earth. Our physical being, we're adopted into the family. Um, one of the points I was making Sunday on Pentecost Sunday was that uh, we've got one God, one spirit, Unity among believers, but when you look at us, there's going to be great diversity. You know, um, I didn't use this Sunday. I used an image from my last congregation where my head usher says, look at that. It looks like Pentecost in there, and, and you had different races and different ages and all this. But in the Revelation, the image we're, we're told in the Revelation is that in the kingdom... There'll be every kindred, every tribe, every tongue. One kid yelled out to the preacher, how did he know it was every tribe? It was a visual image. How did he know? There were still the visual clues. I was still Caucasian. I was still male. I was still normal size. <laughs> you know. So... The, there's 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 that sense of adoption, my body, my life in this world, and yet I'm gonna still claim what John says that we're born from above and that spiritual birth. We uh, covered Mr. Wesley's favorite passage dealing with uh, salvation and the assurance at verse 16. It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. In Mr. Wesley's day, religion, the Church of England, had what you could call no, a hope so religion. You know, you would go to church, be baptized as a baby, go to church, do what the uh, priest said, and you know, when you die, you hope you go to heaven. And Mr. Wesley looked at that passage and said, "No, I can know I am a child of God." Because the Spirit says, you're a child. Now, one of the ways Earl knows Earl's a child of God, God corrects me. If you've never known God's chastening, God's correction, you really need to question your relationship. We're told in Hebrews that every child that's a natural child receives correction. And if we belong to God, God spends a good amount of time talking with us about us, not about Somebody else needing to change, but about me needing to change. And uh, that's, to me, proof that I'm a child of God. You know, when, when you were raising your kids, those of you that are parents, if there were a group of kids acting up, what bothered you most were not what the other kids were doing. 
What bothered you most was what your kid. You may speak to the other child or whatever. You jerk a knot in your own kids, you know, just right now. And God's same way. It's his children that he corrects most vigorously. And this passage speaks to that. Going back to the idea of what's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do for us? But if by the Spirit, I'm at verse 13, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So it's by the Spirit, the deeds of the body. Um, I was listening to Bible this morning and uh, came across a phrasing in the Psalms that I'd never really considered before, and I really wished I had written it down because the exact phrasing is just as gone as it can be from my memory. But what I, I took from the passage was that uh, we're not supposed to let our sin become comfortable for us. I, I spent more time, I, honestly, in my head writing a devotion for the upper room than I did memorizing the word that set me off. I'll have to go back and check it on my phone later. But uh, um, how do we deal with the sins that are my sin that has been with me a long time and that I don't seem to get a handle on? Speaking first person confessional, I had stomach surgery to have a lap band installed because I couldn't control my eating. The Bible refers to gluttony as a sin. I'm still a glutton. I'm just a glutton with a lap band that still to this moment helps me control what I eat. This passage is saying that that's the job of the Holy Spirit. To to work in us to the place that the Spirit gets us. Now, this is not going to happen automatically all for once for everybody. Occasionally, you'll hear somebody who maybe was an alcoholic delivered from alcoholism just immediately on salvation or someone accepts Christ and immediately puts down the cigarette or, or something else that's a, an ongoing thing. But for most of us, it's, it's a process that will take us the rest of our life to work in us. And it's the Spirit's job. Now, if it wasn't for the cross, if it wasn't for the resurrection, for what Jesus does, we wouldn't have the Spirit. And when Jesus says he's going to give us another counselor, uh, another paracletus, uh, the word there for another means one just like the first. And so the Holy Spirit is to us what Jesus would be if he were physically present with us right now. But the Holy Spirit's everywhere simultaneous, and he can be to us and be to you and to you and to you and to you all at the same time, all that Jesus would be if we had a monopoly on Jesus. But it's a process, and it's the Spirit and it's by the Spirit, which means that he's not going to rip it out of my hands, my sin. He will cooperate with me if I want his cooperation. God will bring it to my attention through the Holy Spirit. Earl, you need to deal with this issue. I remember making jokes about my eating and uh, was happy with that until I realized that I was killing myself. And more importantly, that my health was deteriorating fast enough, I would not be able to continue taking care of my wife as what she needed. And so God, through the Holy Spirit, brings it to my attention. Earl, you need to address this situation. And then over a matter of time, gets me to a place where I'm willing and able and starting to address it. Now, I'm still, to this moment, a glutton in the sense that when I stress, I like to overeat. When I'm happy, I like to overeat. It's like the one response I have in life. Whatever happens, let's eat. And and yet, gluttony is a sin. And we would rather have comfortable sins, 
some, you know, we might acknowledge gluttony is a sin, but usually when we address it, we might may say things like, well, but I've never killed anybody, or it's not as bad a sin as X, X, Y, and Z. And I've told you this before. They did a study some years ago, fascinating, about acceptable sins for various denominations. And based on the sins of the clergy in that group, they discovered what acceptable sins. For we Methodists and Baptists, it was the exact same one, gluttony. For Catholics and Episcopalians, alcoholism. You never see a fat Episcopalian. I have never in my life seen a fat Episcopalian priest. It's a horrible sin. In that, but now, it's okay to have a drink. And so, you know, sin's going to get out. And, and all of us are sinners. It's just, what do we try to pretend like is an acceptable sin? This newest generation is looking at sex as an acceptable sin. I don't want to confess any individual's sin, but I've had too many young people tell me that, it, you know, well, it's just not that big a deal anymore. I had someone in the family announce to me not long ago that, well, now it's just, you know, it's just not that big a deal that you wait until marriage. The main thing is that, you know, you're not jumping from bed to bed, that you have a committed relationship. And if you've got a committed relationship, God's okay with that. Show me that in Scripture and I'll believe it. You know, so w my point is we all have acceptable sins that are never acceptable to God. God calls for a bride for his son Jesus that's pure and holy, spotless, without blemish. That's an impossible task except by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, you put to death. Not that you get it under control. Not that you tamp it down to an acceptable level. You kill it. Strangle it until it's dead. I mean, that's a vivid image. You put to death the deeds of the body. Now, in this passage, he's going to talk about the deeds of the body, and he's also going to talk about the flesh. When he uses these terms, he's talking about things that are human versus the things of God. He's not actually talking, when he talks about flesh, he's not actually talking about tissue, skin, bones, sinew. He's talking about worldly things, earthly things. Things, yes, God created, but God is not controlling directly, puppet on a string type control. Um, things outside the desire of God in many cases. And so... Um, you put it to death, and if you do, putting the deeds of the body to death, we live. How is that not works righteousness? And this is where you talk. Just kidding. But now think about that. We're supposed to, the way we live is, is we put to death. But how do we put it to death? By the Spirit. And the focus there really is more on receiving what the Spirit offers us. Um, Confucius said, if you only had a hammer, you see every problem as a nail. What happens if somebody hands you a saw and you'd never once thought about cutting wood, and they hand you a saw and you think, what can I do with this thing? Oh, I bet it'll cut. The Spirit relieves uh, reveals what we didn't know about, about ourselves, about creation, about God. And as the Spirit reveals, the Spirit enables. And so functionally it's not works righteousness because A, we couldn't do it by ourselves, and B, we wouldn't want to do it until the Spirit helps us realize the one who loves you better than you love yourself will be pleased in this behavior. Oh, I want to please God. I want to do this. Ministry of the Spirit. So, 
we put to deed the we put to death the deeds of the body. And uh, second, if we're led by the Spirit of God, we're the children of God. Now, John uses the more biological terms in John three about birth and you know spirit birth versus earthly birth. Uh, it talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in John three. Uh, uh, everyone, uh, the Spirit blows where it wills, and then you know goes on into images of spirit birth there. But here it's it's. It's not as clear we're the children of God, but we receive a spirit of adoption. That is contrasted with the spirit of slavery, which leads to fear. His, his primary point, the spirit, is what makes us the children of God. Now that's still the primary point of John's gospel at John 3, is that the spirit makes us the children of God, whether it's by adoption, as Paul says, or whether it's by birth, as John says, that primary purpose of the Spirit is you are a child. What does it mean to be a child of God? We don't have to fear. We're not slaves worried about Massa coming home and getting the whip and correcting us. Now, parents correct us, but not like a master and a slave. And uh, we did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, that, that Abba, Father, seems to be more of a, a similar cry to what Jesus did in, in, uh, in Gethsemane, crying out, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. That starts in fear and yet gets to the place, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And so we can start sometimes in fear, but remembering to cry to Abba Father, or as I would put it, Daddy God, I'm reminded, Earl, you're a child of God. God's going to take care of you. If you do need correcting, you'll be corrected as a child, not as a servant or a slave. We don't fall into fear. And it's that very witness. Not only, not only are we the children of God, we're confirmed that we're the children of God. Y'all know the, the, the hymn, what's the first hymn in our Methodist hymnal, anybody? Granny, you ought to know this one. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. He breaks the power of canceled sin. The wonderful thing about God is God not only in Christ Jesus cancels our sin, the sin that he cancels, he then removes the power from. How does canceled sin have power? If God forgives me and I don't forgive myself. If God forgives me and I don't really believe it. If God forgives me but somebody else keeps throwing it up to me. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's how he starts this passage, Romans 8, 1. And so we've got this spirit that not only makes us the child of God, constantly reminds us, you're a child. You're a child. Have you ever told your kid you loved him? Was that important? Was it important for you to make sure that in every circumstance that child knows, I love you. You're my kid. Sometimes we say those things when the kid disappoints us. You know, I don't like what you did, but you're still my kid and I still love you. That's what's being described here. God with us. We're always the children of God. God not always happy with everything we do, but the Spirit's still there saying, you're a beloved child of God. You belong to God. And if children, then heirs. What is an heir? 
Somebody who gets something. Somebody who receives a gift, typically at a death, but in this case, God doesn't die, but we're still heirs of God. We still receive as, as children who are in the will. You know, we, we still get the promise. And if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. All right, with all that good, Paul still has to throw in one reminder. God's children are called to suffer. And instead of seeing that as punishment, see that as a reminder, you're a child of God. Now, what was my earlier statement about how, do Earl, how does Earl know he's the child of God? Well, one of the ways is that God's correcting me. Another way is that God calls me sometimes to be in a position that suffering is involved. You know, I don't suffer as do some uh, in the world. Christians are still being put to death in large numbers, and increasingly uh, the world has become anti-religious and specifically attacking Christianity. Um, it seems like a strange world. I, I know this is not a place to offer this to ladies but the strangest thing I think I've ever read in my life, I read this morning uh, at the Scout World Scout Jamboree. You know, they've started admitting girls to Boy Scouts. They're going to offer condoms to the Scouts when they go to the Scouting Jamboree. The wor- yeah. What? Yeah. Is there nothing sacred? Well... If it's sacred, it's that which belongs to God. We keep thinking the world influences God. It's the other way around. God influences the world. And where God's influence has waned, the stuff we would consider moral also wanes. The farther we get from God, the farther we're going to get from morality. And uh, don't blame the kids. The kids have to be raised and taught. You think about the way you were raised. Not just mom and dad, but your entire community, your teachers, uh, people at church, your neighbors were constantly pouring into you a certain understanding of the way you were supposed to be. Some of that we can let go, you know, don't drink, dance, or chew. Don't go with boys that do, uh, or girls that do, for my sake. But uh, uh, a large part of it, these kids don't have, and you know, they're suffering because of it. Today's uh, Nashville, Tennessean newspaper, uh, front page, top left, above the fold is a long article about uh, women, especially mothers, in prison. Women are the largest population increasing in our prison systems here in Tennessee. Drugs and alcohol are the combined. Their life is not worth living. Why isn't their life worth living? As a Christian, I would say it starts because they don't understand who created them and for what purpose. It's a vacuum of God. So those of us who know we're children of God are to help fill that vacuum into preaching. That's the quickest I can go through that passage and even pretend like I struck on the major things. What are your thoughts, comments, remarks? Where did I get it wrong? While y'all were thinking, and in just a second, this is a brochure from Alcoholics Anonymous. Look at the symbol they're using. It's an ancient symbol of the Trinity. Isn't it interesting where Christianity does have influence? What were you going to say?
I do too. I and, 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 and yet it's there and I'm not going to erase it. And, 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 I, and I think about something that you said about, about Carrie is that you, would, you adopted her because your father kept referring to her as a stepchild. So you... Yeah. I hated that word. Yeah, so you I hated improved it. a situation. But see, then to me, I'm sure you don't consider Carrie your adopted child. It, it never occurs to me. Well, and, and so I guess I don't want to think of myself as being an adopted child of God. Well, I, a child of God. I think the father would say, I never thought of you as the adopted okay. child. Okay. But now, okay. let, me, let me give you... An illustration of that that is sort of an extreme. Uh, one of the primary ministries we did in my last congregation was a ministry to adoptees because we started seeing our church became the church for that, not just city or county, but that region over a three state area for adopted children. We just fell into that to the point that once a month, we would pay big money to bring in a Christian counselor from Nashville to Paducah, two and a half hour drive, bring her in, feed the parents in one room with nice adult food, the kids in the fellowship hall, which was really a gym. It wasn't a fellowship hall. It was a gym. The kids were fed kid food. We had people every every person there had a, over the age of 18 had a background check that I personally ran. Every person there was either a member of that church more than six months or had been a member of their church with their pastor's recommendation over six months. We, we made sure their kids were very safe, didn't refuse to accept any fee from any of them. And we were doing this three months before I realized that I qualified to attend I mean, I was, I was, I was shepherding big money into this ministry, and suddenly it crossed my mind one day. Well, Earl, you could attend. I think it was when I looked at the meal they were eating that night. <laughs> the default crossed my mind. Well, I, I should, I should be in that room and not in this room. God never thinks about that. You're a child of God. And, it's my problem that I think about it. Yeah, and, 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 and it is a spiritual birth, but it's also to a physical body that's already been born. When you accepted Christ, you didn't do that before you were born physically. And so that is the adopted part. And even when we talked about spiritual birth, I mentioned the idea then, knowing this passage existed, I mentioned the idea that physically in this life we're still part of the adopted. And that's why Paul tells us over like in 1 Corinthians 15 that we've got uh, a body waiting for us that's glorified without spot or wrinkle. You can say hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Without spot or wrinkle. I say without back problems. And, and Jesus gave us an illustration of that, walking through walls and yet being able to be touched glorified, and yet able to eat fish. And again, my only understanding of that is eternal is really what's permanent. What's earthly, physical, is passing away. Other thoughts? Father, we thank you for calling us and calling us together and calling us yours. Remind us daily, Father, that we are your child, that you love us, and that nothing and all of creation can separate us from that love in Christ Jesus. Amen.